Hello everyone, my name is David Ding and I wanna welcome you to University Covenant Church. Thank you for joining us today. We're so glad you're here. And if you have a family member, friend, or neighbor who would benefit from hearing today's worship music or message, you can text the word SHARE to the number on your screen and you'll receive a link. You can use that link and share that with them because we wanna reach as many people as we can through this online service and you can help us do that by sharing the video with the people God has put in your life. If you are new to University Covenant or would just like to be more connected with our church family, we have a connection card you can fill out. Through this card, we can learn your name and start to get to know you. You can send us your information by texting the word hello to the number shown on the screen. Today, we're continuing with part four of our series, For One Another in a Pandemic. But before we jump into that, I wanted to let you know about a few things coming up in our church. And for more information about any of these upcoming events, you can text the word NEWS to the number on your screen. First, we are excited to announce that next Sunday, October 25th, from 3 to 3.45 p.m., we are planning an extended outdoor unplugged time of worship and a short devotional from Pastor John. This is not a replacement of our Sunday service, which will be posted as typical, but rather a time for people to see each other and worship God together safely outdoors. Next, UCC is hosting a Neighborhood Harvest Festival, which our very own Bronwyn is here to tell you more about. Hey UCC, have you been looking for an excuse to wear a costume in the month of October? Join us on October 31st from 1 to 3 at either Barrow Park, Arroyo Park, or Walnut Park by the Montgomery Soccer Fields for our UCC Neighborhood Harvest Festival. Bring your family, your roommates, whomever you live with, invite neighbors and friends for all the social distancing, candy, treats, games, and fun you can imagine. So it's October 31st from 1 to 3 o'clock. Check the announcements page or your Kids Zone email for more information. Thanks so much. It's going to be a great event. So for more information or to sign up to volunteer, make sure you check out our announcements page. Finally, we are partnering again with the Interfaith Rotating Winter Shelter to house and feed homeless guests in Davis. This year, due to COVID, the shelter has guests set up in apartments, which they need help furnishing and in later months providing groceries for. We would love to furnish a whole apartment with new or gently used goods, everything from trash cans and dishes to beds to sleep in. The shelter will start moving in guests in the next two weeks, so we would love to collect everything by the end of October. We have a Google Sheet online where you can claim an item or two to help keep our homeless neighbors safe and warm this winter. If you would like to support fun community events like the Neighborhood Harvest Festival, as well as the many other ministries of University Covenant Church, you can text GIVE to the number on the screen for more information. There, you can learn about all of the different ways tithes and offerings can be received. Now, today's message is about showing hospitality to one another. Through your giving, UCC shows hospitality to others. You have the opportunity to make a difference in the life of a child who will find hope and love even when life at home is not good. You have the opportunity to make a difference in the life of a teenager who will find an intergenerational community of love and support to encourage them in their walk with Christ. You have the opportunity to make a difference in the life of a married couple being pulled in all different directions in this world. You have the opportunity to make a difference in the life of seniors who might be feeling lonely, especially during this time of COVID. The ministries of UCC impact the lives of so many people, but it's only possible through your financial support. If you have already automated your giving, we just wanna thank you for taking that step and giving consistently. It really makes a huge difference. Now, if you'll join us as our College Ministry Catalyst's sophomore class is going to lead us in a time of prayer. Hi, University Covenant Church. This is the class of 2023, and I'm Michael Shaw. Hi, I'm Adriana. Hey, I'm Matias Smith. Hi, I'm Andrew. Uh, hi, I'm Aaron. Um, if you would join us in this time for prayer. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for the time you've given us today um, to gather as as your people, um, be it in our separate households. Uh, we just thank you for that opportunity that you've given us to um, still come together on, in a virtual setting and, and dive into your word, listen to great music um, and, and worship together. And 
and dive into your word and find the nuances and truths within it as uh, as Pastor John preaches today. Um, we thank you for who you are. Uh, in Jesus' name, amen. Welcome everyone to worship. Let's all sing together as we gather together. I was buried beneath my shame. Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my tomb.
Let justice roll on like a river Let worship turn into revival Lord, lead us back to you When you move The outcast finds a family When you move The orphan finds a Justice roll on like a river Let worship turn into revival Lord, lead us back to you So come, move, so, so come, move Let justice roll on like a river Let worship turn into revival Lord, lead us back to you King of all generations. King of all generations. Let every tongue and nation surrender all to you alone. So come, move. Let justice roll on like a river. Let worship turn into revival. Lead us back to you. So come, move, Lord. So come, move. Let justice roll on like a river. Let worship turn into revival. Lord, lead us back to you. King of all generations. Surrender all to you alone So come, move, let justice roll on like a river Let worship turn into revival Lord, lead us back to you Lord, lead us back to you Lead us back to you so come move in this place Lead us back to you Lead us back to you Lead us back to you Let's sing that one more time So come move So come move let justice roll on like a river Let worship turn into revival Lord, lead us back to you I wonder what it was like. I, mean, I wonder what it was like to become aware of your own existence, maybe for the first time. I don't know what it was like, but I wonder what it was like to, to wake up or to become aware and to be in God's presence. What was it like to be Adam 
What was it like to be created by God and be aware of who you are and be walking with God's presence so close by? I wonder what questions Adam asked. Who am I? What am I? What is this life? What is around me? I wonder what it was like to awaken to self-being and self-awareness and to have communication with God. I wonder if he knew what God was like or that God had to reveal himself over time. I wonder how much he knew of God's true character. I wonder what it was like to experience God's welcome. That when God created the Garden of Eden and created Adam, God showed part of his character, part of his, his posture towards Adam. He revealed who he was towards Adam, even in his interactions with him. He told Adam in the Garden of Eden, says, Now the Lord had planted a garden in the east in Eden, and there he put the man he had formed. The one of Adam's first experiences of God was God saying, Here, this is your home. Welcome. I've created a place for you. What did that communicate about God to Adam? What, what kind of images were formed about who God was like? But God didn't stop with just a place for Adam. He went beyond that. He wanted to show Adam even more. And in Genesis 1.29, it says, Then God said, I give you, Adam, every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. They will be yours for food. Some of Adam's first interactions with God was, Here's a place to stay. Here is your home. I give it to you. And the next was, I give you food. You're going to be taken care of. You have fridge privileges in the house of God. There's this sense of an openness and a welcome. And I wonder what this did to Adam's identity, his understanding of God, his understanding of what it meant to interact with God, his understanding of what it meant to be human, to interact with God and his first Awareness of being human, of being created, and God saying, here, this place I've created is for you to stay. Here, this food that I've created is for you to eat, enjoy, and welcome. I wonder what it was like hundreds of years later for the Israelites to experience years, decades, centuries of, of slavery in Egypt, and then to be rescued by God, to start this new nation, this nation that God had promised would be a blessing to the world, and that they are forming this new nation, uh, having escaped from Egypt, having crossed the Red Sea, have been rescued in the wilderness, and God begins to reveal to them what it was like to be this people group that had God's stamp on it. He pulled this people group aside and said, I'm going to pass on my identity to you. I'm going to give you part of me to express to the world. I'm going to shape you by these commands, these, these instructions on how to live. And I wonder what it was like for the Israelites to hear these words from God in Leviticus 19. God tells them, when a foreigner resides among you in your land, do not mistreat them. The foreigner residing among you must be treated as your native born. Love them as yourself. For you were foreigners in Egypt. I am the Lord your God. God gives these instructions to his people to shape their identity, how they are to live, how are they to be. And one of the things he tells them is how they are to treat the foreigner, the stranger, the one that comes from another land, the one that does not naturally belong. He says, you need to treat the foreigner or the stranger just like one of your own. There should be no difference. He says, why? He says, because you know, you know what it was like to be a foreigner. You know 
what it's like to be a stranger. You know what it's like to be a resident in the land that you're not familiar with. You know what's that, what that's like. And, he, and God says, I rescued you from that. I provide you a name and a home and belonging. I'm going to give you land, a place to be. So when you arrive at this land, you must take this welcome you've experienced from me and give that same welcome to others. When a foreigner enters your land, don't treat them differently. Don't mistreat them. They must be treated as though they were born in your own country. You must love them just like you love yourself because you've experienced me welcoming you in and calling you my own. This is who you are to be. Welcome the foreigner. It was a typical Tuesday afternoon, a typical time where we gather a few staff to talk about the upcoming sermon and talk about ideas that God is bringing from scripture, where the preacher will share what God is speaking to him or her about, and then other staff uh, participate and say, hey, I see this, or what about this? And, and together we begin to share stories and form this idea of what it is that God wants to speak from his word the coming weekend as we talked about God welcoming and making that part of his identity, Tiffany, our new worship director, shared, I know what this is like. I asked, how do you know what this is like? How do you know what it's like to be welcomed as a stranger and a foreigner? And she said, because that was my experience at University Covenant Church. I said, what are you talking about? You came during COVID. You came during shelter in place. You came when we can't interact. How did you experience this welcome? And she began to list event after event, a feeling like a new person, a feeling like a stranger, a feeling like a foreigner in a new land, but having a community come around and embrace her and treat her as one of their own. She talked about how a group of people showed up to help her move from UCC, how another family in our church brought food, made food for not only her, but all the movers that day. She talked about opening at the door to her porch and just having little surprises every day. Food dropped off from various people in our church. Gift cards dropped off from various people in our church. Muffins dropped off from various people in our church. Each moment she opened the door in different, in different scenarios and different situations, she was overwhelmed by people treating her as one of their own. One family in our church even said, hey, you live in Davis now. Do you have a bike and she said no. And so they donated one of her, their extra bikes to her. Now she really belongs to Davis. This was her experience. Another story, Jesus teaching and ministering among people embracing people, welcoming people who seemed far off, who were on the outside, bringing them in and, and giving them a sense of belonging in this family. It didn't matter where they started from. What was more concerning to him is that they knew that, that they had a place to draw towards him and feel like they belonged even before they believed in him. And he speaks to his followers. He speaks to those who want to embrace him as their, uh, as their leader, who want to call themselves Jesus' followers. He says, I'm going to put an identity on you. I'm going to teach you a way to live. And he tells this shocking story. See, in his culture, it was very common for people to entertain one another, to have them come over and serve food. But he wanted to move beyond that. And he shares this parable in Luke chapter 14, verses 12 through 14. He says this, And Jesus said to the host, When you give a luncheon or a dinner, do not invite your friends, your brothers or sisters, your relatives or your rich neighbors. If you do, they may invite you back, and so you will be repaid. That will be your reward. But he says, here's another way. When you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed. Although they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. Jesus says, hey, I know we're used to entertaining one another. I don't think Jesus is saying to stop that. I think there's a lot of one another's 
that talk about care and love and service, where, where having people over is, is, is an expression of that and is a normal and good and blessed part of our identity. But he says, as my followers, there is something that you must do in addition to that. He says, when you invite people over, you need to think about your reward. Where is your reward coming from? See, there's great reward in inviting friends and family over. There's a, there's a connection, a bond and fun. And who knows, they may have you over later on. There's this pattern of, of, of giving back to one another. But Jesus says, there's another type of reward you can get. If you invite people into your home, or you embrace them into your family in a way that they may not be able to respond in the same way. He says, when you do it that way, there's a different kind of reward. It's not necessarily an earthly reward, one that you'll receive right away, but you're storing something up in heaven so that in the afterlife, you will be rewarded by God himself. He says, do that. That's the kind of community we are. We are people who look for those on the outside, the stranger, the foreigner, the one who does not naturally belong on their own. And we say, welcome here. Welcome here. Jesus made a point to make people feel like they belonged before they even believed in him. And he tells his community, I had you brought into me before you were even looking for me. How can you not do the same for others? What is this thing we're talking about in these stories? What's the common thread that goes through all of them? It's a word that you've heard over and over again. I think a word that you and I have probably misinterpreted. It's a word that actually has deeper meaning than we could ever imagine. This word is distinctly a Christian word that, that has repercussions in all kinds of world, places in our world. So it's not only Christian, but it's rooted in the God we worship. This word is called hospitality. And when you and I hear hospitality, we naturally think of inviting people over, or being kind to people, and that is an aspect. But really, that word is really better defined as entertainment. Entertainment is the idea of, of bringing people in and, and, and being nice to them and kind, and that is certainly a part of our Christian identity. But there's another part of our identity called hospitality, and here's the thing that will just blow your mind that the word hospitality in Greek is made up of two different words joined together, two words you would never think would come together. But Jesus in the Greek culture brought them together into one. The first word in the Greek is phylos. It's a word of love, in fact, a word of friendship. It's how one treats a friend. That word phylo, we see it in positive words like philanthropy. This idea of a love for humanity. So phylos is, is this word that, that, that connotates a deep friendship and the affection you have for a friend. It's a very positive word. Philo is the first part of this word hospitality in the Greek. The second word often feels like an opposite word. The word is xenos, X-E-N-O-S. And this word means foreigner or stranger. In our current language today, mostly this word is put in a negative context. We have something called xenophobia, the fear of the outsider, the fear of the foreigner, the fear of the stranger. But this word in the Greek that Jesus uses, that the gospels use, that the Bible use, put these two words, friend and love as a friend, and stranger and foreigner, and joins them together, and that word forms the word hospitality a friend of the foreigner and the stranger. This is hospitality. And this, way, this is why Jesus tells a parable, let's live true hospitality together. When you invite people, who are the people who, who are the foreigner, who are the outsider, who are the stranger? Because part of being part of my people group is reflecting our Father in heaven and what he does for you and me, that he has made a friend out of the stranger that you were far off and he pursued you, that you were created and he gave you food and shelter, 
that he formed a people group that you benefit from where their identity was to welcome the stranger and the foreigner as if it was their own family member. So Jesus says, when you throw a party, go beyond the normal entertainment and invite those to belong with you who are strangers, who are foreigners, who are on the outside of society and just don't feel like they belong. Now, hospitality in ancient cultures, and I think it applies to our culture as well, often had elements of lodging, a place to stay, and a food of drink, a food and drink, a, 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 something to eat or drink, or some combination of those. This is what we mean by hospitality, the idea of you belong and let me provide. Like I said, it's different than entertainment. Uh, entertainment does the same thing, lodging or food or drink, but it's among friends. It's part of a normal, and it ought to be a normal part of our church life, and it happens already. But Jesus has an extra thing, an extra layer to add on to that that says that we're actually a different type of people group. Because of what we've experienced with God, we are to welcome not only our friend, but we're also to look out for those who are literally foreigners, literally strangers, or those who feel that way and feel distinct from the people group that you know, that you belong to yourself. And maybe I just need to pause right now and just tell the grand story that you have been welcomed by God, that while you were far off and a stranger, God has been pursuing you. And if you're watching or listening right now from wherever, maybe you're trying to figure out where you are with God. And I want to let you know that our God is a hospitable God. That was part of his nature as soon as he was revealed to us in Genesis. That's one of the first things he did to express himself. And this is what this means, is that God cares enough about you right now that he is pursuing you in order to invite you in to his family. And you may say, but I'm a stranger. I'm a foreigner. I'm a weirdo. There's so many things in my history that put me outside of God's circle. And I want to say, yes, absolutely. You have positioned yourself in a way that has removed yourself from God. You have made yourself a stranger. You have made yourself a foreigner. You are a sinner. And God looks at that and says, and my job now, what I want to do is welcome you back into my fold. Now, this came at a great cost for God. Someone had to take on the consequences of your sin and my sin. And God took that upon himself by sending Jesus. And out of his love for you, out of his love for me, Jesus came. And for the joy set before him, what the scripture says, endured the cross, took on the pain, took on the consequences of you and I intentionally becoming foreigners to God so that God could open up the door again and fulfill his heart-long desire to welcome you back to his family. Because this is such a key part of who God is, he expects and asks that we as his people group, as his followers, as the church community, exhibit the same type of DNA our Heavenly Father has. And that is to look around and say, who is the outsider? And what does it mean for me personally? And what does it mean for us as a community to look at the outsider and say, we want to be hospitable. We want to live with the truth that we are friends of the stranger. We are friends of the foreigner. So is it no wonder that when Paul writes to the church, he mentions hospitality. The author of Hebrews says this in Hebrews chapter 13. Keep on loving one another as brothers and sisters. All the ways you're used to loving and seeing each other as family. Just want to say at our UCC town hall we just had, we asked, what do you love about the church? And the number one answer is, this is my family. These are my friends. I am loved and I love these people. This is the church. And so the author of Hebrews says, keep on loving each other, one another as family. Treat people as your brothers and sisters, the ones you have good relationships with. 
And so there's a sense of we are being kind and generous and looking out and serving and helping each other move and being uh, generous. We're doing all these things. And so the author of Hebrews says, keep on doing this. Don't quit. And then he adds one more thing. Do not forget to show hospitality, the friend of the foreigner, to strangers. For, so, for by so doing, some people have shown hospitality to angels without knowing it. And here the author of Hebrews is referring to a story in the book of Genesis. Love one another. Our greatest witness to the world is going to be our love for one another in Jesus' name. But we're not supposed to stop there. We're supposed to use that love and look at one another and say, now how do we exert, extend this love that we have for one another and look for who's on the outside and give them a home here too? And so Peter in 1 Peter 4, 9 says this, offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Why would people grumble? Because to be frank, it's really more enjoyable sometimes and way easier just to hang out with people who are already our friends. Can I just be honest? And, and you're going to be honest with me too on this. It is so much fun and it's so easy to just love one another. It's fun. It's great. But there's a point when you realize because of who God is and because of what he's done for me and because of what he's done to the community I belong to, this church, we're called to extend this love to people who feel or look or appear as strangers and foreigners. And let me just tell you, that takes extra effort. And sometimes you can go through the actions, but inside you're just grumbling. I don't like this. This is hard. I hate this. This person's strange or different. So Peter says, look, this is part of your identity. Offer hospitality to one another, but don't grumble. Yes, it's going to be hard sometimes. It's going to be uncomfortable and you're going to feel the rub, but you've got to realize this is what God has and is doing for you. This is what God has and is doing for this community called the church. So we need to do it as part of our expression of who we are because of him. I was thinking about who are some of the people in our community in Davis and surrounding that just naturally because of where we live in our context need to be shown hospitality. I want to throw out a few people groups. The first is this, people who have special needs. Not only is it because it's directly what Jesus says about who we love, but God has blessed the town of Davis of being a magnet, a draw for families who have children and teens with special needs. When Becky and I were first considering and praying about coming here, one of the many draws was that Davis really looked out for kids with special needs and is having a child with special needs that meant a lot to us. But we are in a town, in a community where we have, in a good way, an overproportion of kids and teens with uh, mental disabilities, physical disabilities, ADHD, autism, Down syndrome, all the, all the different disabilities. And this is an opportunity for us that when we see people in our community, when we meet together again and we see kids who have special needs, that we don't grumble, that we don't say, oh, what are they doing to our church? But we say part of our identity is offering hospitality to have the love of family for the stranger. We have an opportunity in our community to be a shining light in our community of a community that is not forced to because of laws and legal prescriptions, but a community that wants to because of our identity and what we've received from God to love the special needs community. Let me throw out another one. International students or international scholars. We are blessed to be right next door to the University of California, Davis. And as a result, a, a, a huge percentage of students and professors that come our way are international from countries all over the world. These are uh, people who we have the opportunity of saying, welcome. 
And praise God, we have ministries like this already in our church. And you know who I'm talking to, those of you who volunteer with international students. But we have the opportunity that when we see an international student or scholar to recognize that they are here, perhaps for a short period, perhaps for a long period, but we want to let them know as a community, welcome, you are a friend here. And we're going to go out of our way to welcome you. This is the context that God has put us in, in our town, in our church. And these are groups that can also feel like the other and not feel welcome and feel like a stranger and be a foreigner. And God says, show hospitality. This is who God is. This is what he is and has been doing for you. And as his followers, you want to be doing the same. So not only do we have the special needs community and the international community here in Davis, but I want to throw out one more. Davis, due to it being a college town, has a, has a lot of transition happening in it. There are people always moving in and moving out, sometimes for a period of four years, sometimes it's just for one year or a few months. So we have a tra- transitional community, which means depending on where you live, you're going to have neighbors coming in and out. So here's a third category, the transitional community, in particular, new neighbors. When you see a new neighbor moving in, whether it's for college or for whatever purposes, recognize that when they move in, they're more likely in that moment to feel like an outsider, to feel like a stranger, to feel like a foreigner. And you have an opportunity in your own neighborhood. And maybe you have people from your church in your neighborhood to make that person or that family feel like they belong. So these are some of the who. The international community, the special needs community, the the transitional new neighbor community. But the big question is really, how? How? This series is called For One Another in a Pandemic. And most of the illustrations we've talked about have been housing for people and serving food and drink, all these things that aren't quite allowed or you have to be hyper cautious right now. So what does this look like in a pandemic? Well, certainly there's ways to do hospitality in people's backyards. And obviously, comfortability levels are different, so you need to be aware of that. But what I've seen illustrated in our own church, I'm seeing in how I've been a receiver in ways that we've expressed hospitality is the power of the drop off at the front door. We seem to found a, find a new way of being hospitable and it's dropping off food, dropping off flowers, dropping off gifts, dropping off clothes, dropping off produce, dropping off gift cards, whatever it is. But we have found a new way that in this day and season, we're not quite able to have people over in our homes as we are accustomed to. But that doesn't minimize the need for hospitality in our communities and in our church, even more so now. So you're going to need to get creative. But what I found is that people are mastering the drop off, the ability to leave something at someone's front door and say, I'm thinking of you. Welcome. You belong. So let us be a group of people who love our neighbor and love the outsider with the power of the simple. I'm going to drop something off for you. Now, you may come up with other creative ideas. Go for it. I just found that we are looking for ways to express this hospitality and we're trying to find creative ways to do this right now. The book of Revelation switches things up a little bit. See, up until now, I've been talking about how God is the host. God is the one that displays hospitality. God is the one that pursues and does everything he can to make outsiders belong. But one of the things that God reveals in Revelation is there is part of this that is reciprocal. See, God does not force hospitality on you. He doesn't force hospitality on us. He's what people call a gentleman. He offers it. But part of what he does in Revelation is he reverses it and says, not only is it in my identity to offer hospitality, but for you to receive that, I want to ask you to offer hospitality to me. He says this in Revelation chapter 3. Jesus is speaking and says, here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. See, what I want to say is that part of receiving this hospitality from God, our creator, is to opening up, opening up yourself 
to welcome Jesus into your life and offering hospitality to him. See, what happens is people often uh, are, who are far from God will, will feel pursued by him in one way or another. Uh, experiences and situations will often go through a crisis and they'll often meet somebody or somebody's who are part of this crazy thing called the church, the Jesus community. And they recognize that God is bigger and more welcoming than they could ever imagine. And at some point, God will reverse the equation and say, now it's time for you to welcome me in. And so I want to ask those of you who feel pursued by God right now, who may, might think of yourself as a stranger or a foreigner of God, to take this moment and welcome Jesus in. I want to share a story from someone from our own church, Daniel, who experienced this with our own college group called Catalyst here at University Covenant Church. Let's listen to Daniel's story. Hi, everybody. If you haven't had the pleasure of meeting me yet, my name is Daniel. I'm a recent graduate of UC Davis, and I've been a member of Catalyst for the last four years. Growing up, I was always really nervous. I had a lot of anxiety, and I wasn't very good at making friends. I constantly struggled with loneliness, and I never really felt like I had a community to turn to. When I got to high school, I realized that it was really easy for me to convince people to be my friends if I could just make them laugh. So that's what I did. I focused all of my energy on making people laugh and have fun. And for the first time in my life, I felt like I had everything figured out. It wasn't until much later that I realized that a lot of those friendships were pretty shallow and in some cases pretty toxic. I was still so lonely. The only thing that changed was that I convinced myself that I wasn't because I was surrounded by people that liked me. I was in pain, but because all of my relationships were so shallow, I didn't have anybody to turn to, and I didn't know how to express my feelings. I had built walls to protect myself from my own feelings, and because those walls were made of laughter, I thought that I was perfectly fine. No matter how sad or hurt or alone I felt, I couldn't show that to anybody because I thought that if I let down those walls for even a moment, I would lose all of my friends, and therefore I would lose any chance I had at happiness. I had similar fears when I was moving to college my freshman year. I was worried because I would go back to having no friends and I couldn't stand the thought of being alone. Nobody was more surprised than me to learn that the answer to my problem would be with a group called Catalyst. I had never been to church before and my family had virtually no religious background, so joining a Christian fellowship was not on my list of priorities. I never intended to join Catalyst, but I went to a couple of their Welcome Week events because I didn't have anything better to do and I quickly started to fall in love with the community. I figured that even if I wasn't all that interested in Christianity, I'd at least found a place where I could make some really good friends. And I definitely did. But there was something really unique about the friendships that I made in Catalyst that I hadn't experienced before. At first, my new friendships were pretty similar to the ones that I was used to, focused on fun and laughter. But after a while, I realized that something was different. These Christians that I had become friends with were trying to get me to share my story with them, and they wanted me to show them more of my feelings than just what was on the surface. This was the first time that anybody tried to break through my walls. They made me dig deep and question my own beliefs about myself. And what I learned was that the secret ingredient that all of my relationships before were missing was a kind of love that I wasn't familiar with. Catalyst is a community that is built on a really special kind of love, where people are willing to challenge each other so that they can grow and be their best selves. For the first time in my life, I knew that I wasn't alone, not just because I had friends that truly loved me, but because I also felt loved by God, who I now believe led me to Catalyst in the first place. I was shocked by this love, so I wanted to take my faith journey a little more seriously, because I thought I might be able to learn more about what it really means to love someone if I could understand who Jesus was. That journey is far from over, and I'm still learning how to love and how to be loved. But if there's one thing I've learned from my time in Catalyst, it's that it's really easy to find a friend that's willing to laugh with you, but it's so much harder and so much more satisfying to find a friend who's willing to cry with you. That's the type of person that you can find in Catalyst, and it's the type of person that they've taught me to be. Not only do I have such amazingly deep friendships with people in Catalyst, I've also used what I've learned to rebuild and strengthen my old relationships with my friends and family back home. I thank God every day that I was found by such a loving community that embodies the powerful love taught by Jesus. 
Daniel, thank you for sharing your story with us. I'm hoping, church, you're catching this picture of God's hospitality to us has implications that we are to be hospitable to others. And it's through that belonging, even before believing that people taste God's presence. And at some, God, at some point, God will reverse the formula, reverse the equation and says, I've been hospitable to you. Now will you be hospitable to me? God is yearning to be hospitable to you. God is yearning to be hospitable to us as a community. And he wants you to be part of a community that is receiving this hospitality and now decides to be a friend, a lover of family, of the stranger and the foreigner, that we do this together as a family, that we're partnering in this. This is not just for you alone, but for us together to partner together and say, how can you and I, how can we do this together? So pull a friend from your church when God puts someone in front of you that needs a welcome and say, how can we do this together? Will you help me think through this? God will put people in your path where it will be on your own you're doing things. Sometimes it's going to be with, with our friends. And sometimes as a church, we organize for this. For example, we have an inclusion ministry in our church for kids with special needs. We have an international ministry that we partner up with. There are things we can do corporately. There are things that you will just do on your own with friends in our church. And there are things where God will put in front of you in the moment where you just as an act of obedience and response to him, you love the stranger. You become a friend of the foreigner and you welcome them in to God's family. So my question for you as we end is who is God putting in front of you? God bless you.
I'm so glad you were able to join us today. If you'd like a reflection guide based on the sermon or lesson plans for kids, please go to ucov.com Sunday. And I hope you'll be back next week as we continue part five of our series for one another in a pandemic. Now, if you'll join me and receive this benediction. UCC Church family, we have been welcomed in as foreigners into God's house. And God invites us into that same mission to show hospitality to those that he has brought into our lives. And so as a family, let us go out and to invite people in safely so that they know that there is a place that they are loved and that they belong. Go in peace. <laughs>